Ian Charnas is a director and co-founder of Sears Thinkbox, a seven-story makerspace and innovation center at Case Western Reserve University that is free and open to the public. He graduated from Case Western with degrees in both computer and mechanical engineering. His personal work blends art and technology in creatively themed exhibits and group projects, including the world's largest twin musical Tesla coils, a real-life Mario Kart, and a waterfall swing. Ian and his work have been featured on Gizmodo, Make Magazine, Wired, Forbes, NPR, NBC, ABC, Popular Mechanics, Boing Boing, Add a Fruit, Pitchfork, and Hackaday. He aims to inspire creativity and the belief that you can do anything. Thanks so much for joining us, Ian. Thanks for having me. So Sears Thinkbox is such an epic process, project. How did you even come up with the idea for this venture? So Sears Thinkbox got started in about 2011, 2010, when a faculty member who was really adamant about experiential learning and the value of being able to apply the knowledge in your class uh, to things like memory retention uh, or, or skills capability years after the class has ended, sort of prevent the diffusion of knowledge at the back of the brain. When he uh, met up with a, a donor uh, named Barry Romick, an alum, who is passionate about the same thing and passionate about the value of experiential learning that he experienced at Case Western Reserve University, when they got together, they said, we need a place where students can make things, whether it's for senior projects, whether it's for a startup that they have an idea for, and the donor was kind enough to chip in a million dollars, uh, which is more than enough to get a pilot off the ground. And we were able to see a 2,500 square foot space get built. Um, fortunately, I was uh, tapped as the initial staff member to uh, build the center and to operate it. And we saw within just a few months, we, we were seeing thousands of visits per month. And it became obvious that the uh, equipment and the activities uh, and the resources of, of Sears ThinkFox we're not going to fit inside a 2,500 square foot space in the basement of an engineering building on campus. Um, fortunately, other donors saw the value and saw the energy and the excitement, and they themselves got filled with energy and excitement, uh, which translated into a, a building being renovated on campus that had been used for storage. It's a seven story, 50,000 square foot facility that's now home to the $50 million Center for Innovation and Makerspace that is Sears Thinkbox. And I've actually had the opportunity to tour the ThinkBox on a couple of occasions. And there's a lot that goes into this makerspace, not only the equipment and the overall setup itself, but the training, the safety protocols. How was all of that? How did you conceive the ideas behind that and what all would be needed in order to determine how this would even work? Great question. I think it was Isaac Newton was one of the people who stood on the shoulders of giants, and we were certainly in the capa in the position to do that as well. So before we got started on Thinkbox, we did our due diligence to sort of level set the field. We went around and toured MIT, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, uh, makerspaces all across the nation to understand how is this done? How is safety and training done? Uh, and we were also able, fortunately, because of the, the collegiate nature of academia, to um, ask them questions about what, what they wish they would have done differently when starting up their spaces. And so we were able to avoid some of the mistakes that others had made because they were so generous in sharing that information. Um, and I sometimes feel fortunate to work <clears throat> inside academia where I can go to Stanford and I can go to MIT and say, hey, I'd really like to know how you do this. Why did you choose this wire EDM machine? How do you keep students safe on the water jet? Um, have you had an issue? with fire and your dust collection. Um, and we're able to get uh, really clear and valuable information. If I worked for Apple, which, which is a wonderful company, I, I wouldn't be able to go uh, up to colleagues or friends I happen to have at Google and say, hey, how did you do this <laughs> backend uh, server solution here? How do you do your content delivery network? That, that wouldn't be considered appropriate. Um, so there's a friendly uh, collegiate nature in academia that honestly makes it a, a fun place to work. Um, so I'm happy to be here. Uh, so we, we now are, are doing our part to share our information with other universities, other high schools that are starting makerspaces. So we've uh, now done some, some small time consulting for um, a little bit over 200 universities, colleges, high schools, as they start their space where we can say what worked well here at Sears Thinkbox and what we would have wished we would have done uh, differently from the get-go. 
One thing I really admire about you, Ian, is the way that you are able to make things happen, almost like a duck where the legs are paddling really fast below the surface of the water, but it makes it seem effortless on top of the water. Uh, you said like at the beginning here that you got tapped for this project. Now, they sought you out for a reason. So if you were going to advise me, advise the viewership, on what kind of characteristics might have made you as an appealing person to lead this endeavor, I'd love to hear what that looked like. Um, now, be advised, you're asking a Midwestern person to say nice things about themselves. We're not particularly good at that, but I'll try. <laughs> um, I was uh, fortunate to go to Case Western um, with you and get uh, my engineering degrees here. I, I studied computer and mechanical and electrical engineering, so I had a broad range, uh, not, not as deep as a PhD, but I, I had a nice broad range of experience, um, which helped uh, me understand the needs of different departments, helped me understand that uh, it's not all mechanical engineering, it's not all electrical engineering, it's not all uh, computer engineering, um, to help understand, okay, we've got to be thinking about civil, we've got to think outside of engineering. We have to think about biology, we have to think about chemistry, we have to think about psychology and art history. Um, we've seen uh, students and faculty from every department come here and use the makerspace uh, for all sorts of really interesting research projects, academic projects, uh, startups, uh, as well as just fun personal projects. So obviously you've had a lot of projects, a lot of endeavors here. Have you faced any adversity or setbacks during any of these? And how have you dealt with that? Sure. Um, we, uh, we face, if, if we don't face setbacks, you're not doing anything of great merit, <laughs> right? Um, so there's, there's regular everyday setbacks where we, we log what happened in our, our journals or our lab notebooks or however you keep your notes um, so that they're kind of solidified and, and they don't evaporate out of the back of your head um, through our, our failable human memory. Um, but there's larger setbacks where an entire project fails uh, or where you decide, you know what, this project is no longer uh, worth doing. Um, I, I recently was watching uh, Zach Friedman, he's a, an electrical engineer, YouTuber. He'd actually make a great uh, interviewee uh, for this. And, I'm um, such a fan of his, yep. He had a, a really good uh, uh, litmus test for when you should give up on a project. Um, it's hard, it's hard to give up on a project. It's sort of, it feels like admitting a personal failure. Um, and yet, you know, at, at smart companies like Google, they'll tell you to fail fast and fail often. Uh, fail as soon as you can so that you can uh, get over the project and get onto one that, that has a, a better uh, success uh, potential. Um, but it's still very difficult to give up a project. It makes it feel like I failed rather than uh, this ended up not being a good idea. It's hard to decouple the idea from your sort of like personal pride, uh, you know, or if you have, if you have a, a pretty high work ethic, it's hard to decouple not finishing a project. It's hard to do that. And so he has a really cool litmus test he uses to determine when to jettison a project. He said, if somebody, if somebody took this project and, and dumped it on your desk and said, hey, I, I don't want to finish this. Do you want to finish it? Right. And you take, you take a look and you see, okay, there's a couple hundred dollars of materials here. This person maybe invested five years of their time, but that wasn't my time, right? That wasn't my money. So I'm being asked now, looking forward, you know, not spending uh, not tossing bad money after good, not tossing bad time after good time, but now looking forward, is it worth continuing? And I think that really helps decouple it because it, it depersonalizes it. It's not about me and my will to get things done and do a good job and work hard and, and try to be proud of my work. It's about whether this project is, is really worth continuing. Um, so that's a really cool litmus test. Um, I think the, the biggest um, loops <laughs> uh, that, that I have gone through uh, on these projects that we've gone over would be one thing we tried to do with the Tesla Orchestra. Um, we wanted to audition for America's Got Talent. There was a musical Tesla Coil group that, that got on the show. Um, I think they, they lost after the second round, but we had, some, we had some new ideas, we had new skits, we had new things we were doing with the Tesla Coils that were entertaining that we wanted to share with people. Um, and so we um, were trying to film an audition tape of this magic trick. Um, that we uh, had made involving a, a system that our one team member had built that fro uh, flies props around a stage um, by invisible wire. And it was very cool. And we had a, a, a curtain 
uh, made of CO2. And we had all of these cool sort of sciencey magic, magical illusions. Um, and we had just a month to film it before we were going to get the boot from our, our rehearsal space. And we, we worked as hard as we possibly could. There was no, no erg of energy that was not spent um, in pursuit of, of finishing this. And yet when, when the deadline came up, we fell just short. Um, we got things working. We tried to film, they broke. We fixed them. We tried to film again, they broke. And uh, it, it became, it was the day before we had to give up the space. It was, well, it was the day of, it was 5 a.m. And we were just devastated um, that we had put so much time and so many resources into our, our, our mystic cube illusion, we called it. And it didn't work. Uh, and it was hard to accept, especially because we had to wake up in three hours and start disassembling everything uh, while feeling that way. But one of the things that, that buoyed me through it was um, the idea that you don't, you don't win all the time. Um, and if you can only uh, accept the outcome or if you can only get through life uh, by winning every single time, it, it's going to be not as rich of a life uh, as you can get through. So, um, you know, having experiences like that helps you empathize with someone else when they're going through a project that, that failed at the end, despite their best effort, despite their best talent, and to say, um, you know what, we, were, we, we can't win all the time. We, 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 we didn't win that particular project. We didn't finish it. It didn't work, um, but we will persevere. I love the way you approach this, Ian. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm personally, for at least years in the past, I'm one of those people who, when a project didn't go the way that I thought it would, would try to hide that from as many people as possible when people were being kind and checking in for updates. But I, I love what you're saying as an approach, and I haven't heard this before. Of, I mean, it's such a technical, logical approach to take notes, to chart that. And it just makes sense because it's going to be an investment in future endeavors, as well as helping you keep sight and have some perspective um, on the status of the current project. So I love the way you approach this. I love what you're saying with applying it to overall life. And I cannot wait to see your continued projects that you're putting out there into the world. What is the best way for people to follow your work? Sure. Um, I'll tell you that, and then I'll, I'll add one more thing that maybe the editor won't try. The best place to follow me right now is through YouTube. I think uh, all of my projects now are going through YouTube. So if you visit youtube.com slash Ian Charnas, you'll be able to follow me there. I'm also pretty active on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. I'm Ian Charnas on all of those channels. And uh, if you're someone who um, uh, maybe wisely issues social media, um, I also send out uh, very, very short and infrequent uh, email updates where it's just two sentences and a link to a project. Um, so if you prefer email, you can sign up at iancharnas.com and there's a button somewhere that says get updates and you'll be able to sign up for email updates. So I, I hope that people uh, enjoy these projects and, uh, and it, it brings some, some laughter to their lives. And I hope also that it, it's sort of, people see it as engineering uh, in a rigorous way and, and science in a way that's, that makes it worth it. Um, but also regarding uh, failure, I wanted to add one other thing, which is that as, as I work on these videos and I show the build process, um, it's tempting to just show the path that took me to success and not to show the 10 paths that led me to think, oh, okay, I bought the wrong thing. Oh, that actually didn't work. Oh, that leakage current number that's published in the data sheet doesn't apply to my application. Um, and yet I can't include every single uh, way of failure because it makes the videos too long. Uh, I can't go too deep on things like programming in the videos because the viewers drop off uh, like like it was an avalanche. Um, and so there's there's a balance. There's a game that is played between how to keep things entertaining and engaging, well, how to be uh, super honest, as honest as we can be about what went into it. So each of the videos um, show, I, I believe, shows uh, some of the failures, but there were actually many more that I couldn't include uh, due to length. And so I'm trying my best to show that even the best of us and, you know, I'm not saying me, I'm saying people who, who really know what they're doing are far better than I am, um, uh, will run into uh, things that didn't work. And you, you have to just get through them and get onto the things that do work and try not to let you down. But for, for a beginner to look at a finished YouTube project and say, wow, I could never do that, is depressing. I hope that for them to see, wow, this person who 
has engineering degrees and seems like they're they're smart enough to get by in the world um, is making failures left and right. It's it's okay to fail, right? Um, I think that's an attitude that um, that we can promote uh, because it helps us get to the non-failure state of success. What I love about this conversation, Ian, is I feel like there are equal parts inspiration for engineers, tech-inspired enthusiasts, and creators. It doesn't matter which sector you are, what you're saying. I think each group can really sink their teeth into and pull out some helpful tips from. So thank you once again for being willing to join us and sit down with us and have this discussion today. Thank you so much, Jackie. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, please click like below and also subscribe to see future episodes.